a divine event from Neville Goddard. December 8th, 1969, a divine event. Christmas is the proclamation of a divine event to which all creation aspires. It is an event which puts an entirely different light upon human life, for it proclaims that man has been saved. I question seriously whether part of 1% of those who call themselves Christian know what this event is about. Tonight, I will tell you from my personal experience. Paul tells us in his letter to the Corinthians that no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is nothing more than the individual's personal experience of the event. For in the book of John, the risen Christ proclaims that he will send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, who will lead you into all things and bring to you remembrance all that I have said to you. In the beginning, you were told that which seemed incredible, and the Holy Spirit is your experience of that event. For only then can you know that Jesus is Lord. Now, who is Jesus? He's your awareness. Your I am-ness. In the book of Exodus, Moses was told to say unto the people of Israel, I am has sent you. This is my name forever. By this name I shall be remembered throughout all generations, and besides me, there is no other Lord. Jesus is the Lord. Your I am-ness, your consciousness of being Joshua, is the Hebrewic form of our word Jesus and means Jehovah is Savior. There is no other Lord than I am. Our God is a God of salvation. To God, the Lord belongs escape from death. God is buried in humanity to make man a living being, and he will rise in the individual as his own wonderful human imagination. The discovery of God within is the one far-off divine event to which creation moves. The only resurrection spoken of an in scripture is when he rises in you, and the only birth spoken of there is when he comes out, and that is Christmas. The event seems to be single and separate from the other events, but they are all part of a complex whole. We are now approaching one part we call Christmas, the birth of God, the birth of I am. Where could you go that you are not aware of being? Therefore, where can you go and not find God? If you lived in hell, would you not be aware of being there? So God is in hell? If you lived in ecstasy, you would be aware of your ecstatic mood and that awareness of God. For I am is the only name of Jesus. In his book called Acts, Luke said, There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. To call Jesus? No. To be aware. Without using words, when you are aware you are saying, I am, that is Jesus, who is buried and rises in you. And when he escapes from the tomb of your skull, Christ is born. We are taught that this happened 2,000 years ago among people who are long gone from this world. But I know from experience that when it happens in you, it is strangely contemporary. Yes, Christ was born. That is a fact. But it's not over, as it's still taking place in the individual the world over. Christmas is that one far-off great divine event to which the whole vast world is moving. If you ask someone who calls himself a Christian who Christ is, the chances are he would tell you that Jesus is the Son of God. And if you told him that he must be God to know that, he would be horrified and tell you that you are blasphemous to suggest such a thing. 
But if you return to the proclamation of the great event, you will find that no one knows who the Son is except the Father. So if you know God's Son is Jesus Christ, then you have to be God the Father. And since no one knows who the Father is except the Son, Jesus Christ must be revealed you as his Father. Well, man cannot rationalize this because he has not had the experience, for no one can know that Jesus is Lord, which is God the Father, except by the Holy Spirit, for it is he who brings you the experience of the great mystery. We are told that when Paul rose up into the third heaven, he heard utterable words. Some translations say that they were words which man may not utter, but it isn't that. What Paul saw and heard was incapable of expressions in words. There are no words to express a body that one wears when he rises within himself. For it is not a body of flesh and blood, but an indescribable form divine. In his 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul said, What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body which is to be, for God gives it a body as he has chosen. I will know you in eternity, but for all the identity of purpose, there will be a radical discontinue of format form. Yesterday morning, when I returned to this level of my being, I rested the body I was wearing to spend some 10 to 15 minutes right on the surface of my being. The form is alive. It is all energy, all power, all wisdom, and all love. I wear that body as I do the suit I am wearing now. Only I know it to be my very self. I am always in control by intensifying my energy or modifying it. In that body, I looked out over glorious scenes never seen on earth. They were all three-dimensional visions in vivid colors and indescribable forms. I would observe one, then let it go to observe another. All heavenly treasures which are in me. When your eyes begin to open inwardly into the world of thought, into eternity, you will see that no mortal eye turned out could ever see. There are no images in this outer world to describe the eternal world, which is imperishable. The world you will see when you are wearing Christ the new man. This is an indescribable, infallible mystery, for God comes to us as one unknown, yet one who will allow the individual experience who he is. When you experience Christ, you are experiencing who you are, for you are the Jesus of Scripture. You are the Lord God Jehovah. The event toward which you are moving is the awakening of the Lord in you. Then and only then will you know who you are. Christmas is a, simply the proclamation of this one far off divine event to which creation moves. It is not about who lived a long time ago, but about you. The Bible is very personal. It is your own spiritual biography your salvation history. To see the characters of scriptures as characters of history is to see their true tempered the weaknesses of the human soul. They are not characters on the outside, but within you, for the drama unfolds in your imagination. You are buried in yourself and do not know it. But when you reach the fullness of time, you are awake to Christmas. Last lecture night, I told you of an experience of a friend who tasted of the power of the age to come. She had found herself in a dream in the home of people who have not changed the fashion of their outer garments for 300 years. The woman's second husband had been killed by the group, and she tried to persuade them that what they had done was wrong. But they would not believe her. A group of men, all dressed in black and carrying machine guns, arrived, ready to kill everyone. And when she tried to persuade them that it was wrong, they could not understand. 
Then she began to awake in her dream to realize that, although they all seemed to be independent of her perception of them, they were only aspects of her dream. Arresting her power, her perception, everything froze. She changed their intentions, realized the activity in her which allowed them to become reanimated again, and watched as the man put down his gun and with outstretched arms went over to embrace the woman. This is the power of which I speak. It is a power unknown to the mortal rational mind. We think power is the atom bomb. In hydrogen energy, money in the bank, or securities. Tonight, undoubtedly, a dozen or more very wealthy men will die and not take one penny with them. They simply left the garment of flesh and blood they made so real along with their securities. But you can never lose the power of which I speak, for it is forever. These bodies die, and all that they possess will die with them. But the power of imagination is imperishable, for it is the power of God and man, called Christ. Man is slowly awakening to this power, and when he hears and senses it, this is the power he will exercise. Now, in my friend's case, she awoke in her dreams to discover that, although everything seemed to be taking place independent of her perception of it, the dream was only herself pushed out. Knowing that she could control the dream, she changed the motivation of the man from murder to love. Then she released the activity which allowed them to become reanimated again, and they obeyed her command. This is your future your inheritance, where everything is under your control. These bodies of flesh and blood are only garments of God wears. Even though they are consumed in a furnace called cremation, the bodies are restored for others to occupy. The world is restored, but you, the actor in the drama, move up until you finally awake, and that is what we call Christmas. Christmas is the awakening of God and man. It's not an event which took place 2,000 years ago, but it's taking place all over the world in those who have reached the fullness of time. When the fullness of time has come for you, you begin to stir, to awaken from its, this dream of death and come out of your skull, which is your birth from above. These two events take place the same night. We separate them by three and a half months and then add a few months to the discovery of the fatherhood of God. Then the more time to the ascension of the spirit. But there are four parts of the one grand event. The first is resurrection. The second is birth. The third is the discovery of the fatherhood through the son. And the fourth is the ascension, the rising of the son of man, who you are, into heaven, into a separate form, serpentine form. Tonight, many are preparing for the great event and singing their heads off on Christmas morning. I'm all for it. Let them have fun. But they will be singing of one they do not know. They will sing their hallelujahs, thinking that someone in time and space is responding to their adultion. But that's not Christmas. In the world moving among them, walk those who have experienced the event. They know that Jesus is Lord and that he is the wonderful human imagination, their I am-ness. I am is Jehovah's name forever. By this name I shall be remembered throughout all generations. You now are a living being because Jehovah is buried within you, and you are destined to become a life-giving spirit as my friend discovered she was, stopping the activity in herself, which allowed others to be alive. She changed their motivation by giving a command which was in conflict with their intentions. Then she released the activity in her, and they became reanimated once more, not to carry out their former intention, but to execute her command. She has now tasted of the power of the age to come. On this level, we argue, trying to persuade the other that he is wrong when he knows he is right. 
so we end up just where we stand. This is life in a world of death where everything waxes, wanes, and vanishes. But you are destined to enter the world of which I speak. It is eternal and cannot be entered with a body of flesh and blood, but requires a new body. So unless what you sow dies, it cannot be made alive. And what you sow is not the body which is to be, but God, who is yourself, gives you a body as he has chosen. It is a glorious body of power and wisdom and called the body of Christ. It is a worn as you would a garment. Only you are in control of your power throughout the innate wisdom, a wisdom to which no doubt is attached. This proclamation is not discovered by some rational argument. The gospel is not discovered. It is disclosed. It is not something you can logically prove, but a self-revelation of God. Scholars can study the life of teachings of Jesus until the end of time, but never find in the study who the Father or the Son is. If they did, they would not tamper with the Bible. In the earliest of all books, the book of Mark, the statement is made, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The phrase, the Son of God, is an addition by a scribe. The earliest and best manuscripts that we have omit that phrase, the Son of God, and read, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word gospel means good news. This is good news that Jesus is the Lord Jehovah and Christ is his power and wisdom. He is buried in us and he will rise in us. You will know of his rising because the day he rises in you, the very Im imagery of scripture will surround you and you will know that you are the one spoken of as Lord Jesus Christ. Then you will discover who the Son is, for you will know that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, by experience. And you can only know your Son from experience. David, the personification of humanity, fused into a single being, stands before you as called the Father. You are told at the end, of the Old Testament, that a son honors his father. If then I am a father, where is my honor? In other words, where is my son? The New Testament begins by revealing the son, but man cannot understand. He does not know that Jesus is Lord, who is God the Father, until he has the experience of waking and rising in his skull, of coming out of that skull and holding that Christ child, the son of his resurrection in his own hands. He must stand before the Son of God, and David must call him Father. And may I tell you, at the moment that there will be no doubt in his mind as to who the Son is and who is his relative to that boy. He will know he is David's father, and David will know he is his son. In the book of Samuel, we read, when you lie down in your father's, I will rise up after your son, who will come forth from your body. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. Now we jump to the book of Revelation, where the Lord is speaking, saying, I am the root and the offspring of David. I am the root, the cause which is the father. And I am the offspring of my son, David. Therefore, I am one with my grandson. All the members of the human race are fused together in a single being called David. And what comes out of that? David's offspring. If David's root is the Lord, what comes out of David must be one of his root. So I am the root and the offspring. I am the grandfather and the grandson and David is my son. My man matures when he becomes his grandfather, for the grandfather is the Lord. We are dealing with a mystery. If you think when you read the story of the Old or New Testament that you are going to reach truth by some rational argument, you are searching in vain. The wisest of the wise cannot see it and became because it is rational that they call it a myth. But I tell you, he gives himself to whomever he will, even the lowliest among men. 
Those who have all their degrees, honors, money, and reputation are dead, but do not know it. I do not condemn them or argue with them, but simply walk by, looking for willing ears to tell my story to. And usually, it is to those who are not the scholars of the day. Those who hear my words may not understand them, but lacking my message in their hearts, they ponder it. And one day, believing as I hoped they would, it will erupt within them. Then they soon too will know that the Lord Jesus is he who the world calls the God of the universe. They will know it because the Holy Spirit brought to their remembers all that I have told them. Let the world go blindly on as it will. Eternally awaits. It doesn't matter how long it takes. Everyone eventually will come into this knowledge. But no one will come until he hungers, until he thirsts after God with a thirst that only experience of God can satisfy. The world now understanding scriptures thinks that God will send a physical famine. Oh, that is possible. It happens all over the world anyway. It's not because we cannot supply the food. The problem is economic. We are told to curtail production as we cannot find bins large enough to house our supply. We put an enormous weight on the taxpayer because we allow food to rot as we do not know how to give it away. People are paid not to grow food while our government talks about not being able to supply. Our southern states alone could grow enough food to feed and clothe the world, but how to do it under the present economy. I am not an economist, so I cannot tell you how, but I do know it is not a lack of production, but rather a lack of economy. The economic problem I cannot solve, but I can tell you that Christ in you is your own wonderful human imagination, that the God of Scripture and the Lord Jesus Christ is your I am. Let the world scoff at it. That is perfectly all right. They are only fulfilling Scripture. Scoffers will come scoffing, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued as they were from the foundations of the world. So let them scoff, but you accept my message and put your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you. Hope it will erupt within you now, in the not distant future, and then, when you shed the garment of flesh, as you must, you will be clothed in power, clothed in wisdom, clothed in love. Those who will have not experienced before they depart this world are restored to life to find themselves in a world just like this. They will be faced with all the problems that have neglected here. They may leave their garment of a billionaire to find themselves a shoe shine boy or one who cleans latrines. And that is what must be done to rouse them to believe the incredible story. Don't think that your present position in life is an indicator of what you will be when you leave here. If Christ has awakened in you, you will find yourself in a terrestrial world like this, in a body like these, new and young, but not a baby. You will be doing something best suited for the work yet to be done in you. Until that power in you awakes, you will continue using the rational mind in a rational world just like this. The Christmas that we know look forward to celebrate in one aspect of the great event. There are four definite acts in the single event, which begin with your resurrection. This is followed by the birth from above. Then David reveals your fatherhood, and the fourth and final act appears when you ascend into heaven in a serpentine form and enter violently clothed in power. Now let us go in peace. That was a divine event by Neville Goddard.